Hey, welcome to 93.94. This is Travis. How you doing? Good to have you here. One thing about the 90s that I've kind of been neglecting a little bit on this show is the prevalence of industrial music. Electronic music has been around since the 70s. It is, in a lot of ways, still in its heyday, and it has evolved into forms that I know and, frankly, care little about. But I will say, in the 90s, there was a lot of industrial bands that I did get into for some time, although not Front 242 or Front 242, however it's said. I didn't really nail that down with my guest today, David Rosen from the Piecing It Together podcast was kind enough to come onto the show and talk to me all about their album. I'm just going to call it Evil Off. There's a lot going on in this album. There's a lot going on at once for the listener to absorb. So I definitely needed uh, someone to hold my hand through this industrial experience. And I really appreciate Mr. Rosen coming on and talking about it with me. Check it out. going do you prefer david or can i call you dave either way uh dave is cool i appreciate you getting up good and early and well it sounds like that's the norm for you but still like to be raring to go i appreciate it yeah usually up early but also usually to bed early last night i was up late so uh i kind of messed that whole equation up (laughs) but uh you know i'll be all right (laughs) good good all right man so thank you welcome to the show totally appreciate you coming on I, uh, I always start my show the same way, which is asking how you and I know one another. Dave, do you want to tell the people how you and I know each other? Uh, Twitter. It, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. it, it's a cesspool, <laughs> but otherwise, it's you know, you, you connect with lots of other cool podcasters, and that's basically it. You're actually the first person to come on that I don't know in real nice. life, but I've met you through Twitter. Of course, I feel a little bit like I know you because I've listened to your podcast, Piecing It Together. I've listened to that a few times. Tell us about that. What is the premise of your show? How long you've been doing it, etc. Yeah, I've been doing Piecing It Together five years now. And what we do is I have guests on all the time and we take a look at a movie through the lens of what other movies might have inspired it. So we will be uh, talking about, say, Barbie, for example, this weekend. And, you know, maybe talking about the Lego movie or uh, talking about... I don't know, maybe the Truman show or something like that, something Mm -hmm. where people are like looking in on this other world. And so like finding different kind of themes and uh, different kind of connections that we can make to other films that have come before that kind of deal with similar ideas. To me, it's a big celebration of movies and all of those inspirations. And by the end of each episode, you end up with a uh, cool list of other films to check out if you uh, really love the one that is featured. It's a lot of fun and you have a ton of different guests on. You're clearly very used to talking to a bunch of different strangers and whatnot on a regular basis. (laughs) Multiple times a week, it seems like. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, I want to pay you a compliment about your show, too, is and kind of in a left handed way, insult myself and other podcasters in that most podcasters, we tend to be a pretty self-absorbed bunch. Mm. It takes a lot of uh, maybe not a lot of ego, but at least a little ego to get in front of a computer and talk a whole bunch. But I really like your show in that you don't seem to have a lot of ego going on. You're very genuinely interested in what your guests have to say. Uh, You let them kind of go on. You don't interject. You don't try and superimpose a bunch of yourself onto it. It's refreshing. I really like it. I appreciate that. Yeah. No, I I mean, I love talking about movies and, you know, like I'm really happy to be on your show and talking about music, but as a music composer myself, that's part of the reason that I didn't start a music podcast is because if I was doing a music podcast, I'd probably want to talk about my music the whole time. But with (laughs) movies, it's like, I just want to have a good conversation about movies, you know? Well, while we're on the subject though, let's not move past it. Where can people find your music if they want to check it out? 
Ah, yeah. Uh, well, all my music is under my name, David Rosen, on all of the streaming services, the evil streaming services. <laughs> but also you can find uh, my albums on Bandcamp and stuff like that. And I have a website by davidrosen.com. Uh, yeah, I, I compose music for film. I put out albums of instrumental music, very heavily inspired by the album we're going to talk about today. All right. Yes. Front 242. This is one of those bands that I've heard the name since the 90s over and over again. I don't know that I really knew what genre they were until mm -hmm. you reached out. We're like, I'd love to talk about Front 242. And I was like, okay, this is an album I've heard a ton about. And then I, of course, started listening to it. It was like, okay, I cannot do a podcast on this era without touching on some of the pivotal industrial albums. So I'm yeah. really glad you reached out because it's frankly a genre and whatnot that I'm pretty unfamiliar with. So I'll need some guidance. So how did you get into this album and this band? It's funny when I saw like your podcast and like specifically the being, you know, this 93, 94 era, like that was exactly when I was getting into this kind of music, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I mean, of course we had like Nine Inch Nails, we had Ministry, uh, Thrill Kill Cole, KMFDM, all these groups and a lot of them off of the Wax Tracks Records label, which very strangely and coincidentally, my family owns a record store called Wax Tracks Records. Oh, that's and that's where I work during the day. <laughs> and yeah, it, it was just this big coincidence that the music I kind of gravitated to in high school was on this label called Wax Tracks. And and, you know, it was pre-internet. So like, obviously they didn't know my dad's store. Mm -hmm. My dad didn't know them. So yeah, it's just a weird coincidence. But I had a couple of friends who had like really started like kind of going down the rabbit hole off of, I think Ministry and Nine Inch Nails are probably the most yeah. known, you know, and then going down that whole rabbit hole into what the other industrial groups were that came before. And they kind of got me into this stuff. And at the time I was like really big into the cure and Depeche mode mm -hmm. and, and they're still like my favorite bands like overall, but there's a pretty clear stepping stone. I think going from the darkness of those groups to the darkness of a lot of industrial music. Yeah. And so it all kind of fits together in a way. This is just a lot heavier and, you know, it gets a lot more electronic along the way. That's kind of where I kind of came in and I know like Front 242, Front 242, everybody says something different, but their fans mostly talk about their 80s stuff. But for me, maybe it's because I came in in the 90s. Their 90s stuff is what I love about them. Like their 80s stuff is great too, but like the 90s stuff is the essential Front 242 for me. Yeah, I hear you. They seem to be big pioneers in the genre from what I've gathered since. And I wasn't totally ignorant to the genre when I was younger, like you said, I mean, Ministry and Nine Inch Nails were pretty inescapable. Um, are you about my age? I was born in 1980. 1980, yep. Okay, yeah, I figured. Pretty early on, we were getting that kind of stuff pushed in our faces in the best possible way. That video for uh, Ministry's, um, oh, you know, the, with the fucking bridge going back and forth. That got a seventh yeah. grade me very much in tune with what's going on there. And I got into Pop Elite itself and KMFDM and some of that other stuff. So it's almost funny to me that I didn't go down this deep Mm -hmm. This is less accessible. There's not like a sure. perceivable choruses so much or like hooks. This is industrial, the truest sense of the word, and that it really literally sounds like someone's building something, like constructing something, but also there's space lasers. Yeah, sure. There are space lasers in it, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> yeah, it gets really weird at times. And it is very hard to pin down genre. Like, industrial is the genre mm -hmm. overall, but, like, it gets alternative, it gets ambient, it gets kind of all over the place. And, yeah, that is kind of a hard sell in any era, but in the 90s for sure. By the end of the 90s, I didn't join rave culture and all that, but I certainly had plenty of friends who did. And, you know, there's something to getting just completely locked into a specific groove and just being in that for a long time. And in listening to this album in preparation for recording with you, I definitely found myself doing that quite a bit, just kind of like, uh, I don't know, zoning out. <laughs> to sure. It. It's very yeah. entrancing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then it like hits you over the head with like really heavy shit that's like, you know, much more the heavy end of industrial, but it also will will totally zone you out for sure.
if you have to pick a single best track on this album, are you able to do that? And it's funny because these tracks really blend together. I had a little bit of trouble parsing them apart, but what's your favorite? Right. Well, it's difficult because, yeah, they do kind of blend together at times. And like, obviously, there's like, I think four or five different versions of Animal, mm -hmm. which is like, you know, like that's crazy <laughs> as, as itself. And then three or four versions of Modern Angel. But I mean, for me personally, Junk Drum is the standout. And, you know, like I said earlier, this album is like hugely influential on me and my own music. Mm. Junk Drum is the reason I bought a MIDI keyboard and software and like wanted to try to figure out how to make music. Like listening to that song and like just how, how beautiful, but heavy, but dark, but weird and ambient and rock and just everything kind of mixed together. The fact that I knew that these were just some dudes in a in a studio with a keyboard and just like making music like it wasn't like a band in the traditional sense and at the time like just the thought of joining a band just wasn't something that you know even appealed to me in any way and the thought of like being able to like sit there and tinker and like make music happen like yeah this song is just so inspirational to me. listen to this album in like a while because one thing you know maybe you want to talk about is that it is very difficult to find right now because yeah. of rights issues and you pretty much have to listen to it on youtube from just random uploads but yeah so i hadn't listened to it in a while even though i have it on cd but i haven't touched my cds in like 20 years but <laughs> it was really awesome like revisiting it after all these years I actually just got a CD player for the first time in a while. I'm like, oh yeah, I can start revisiting a lot of this stuff that's not available anywhere else. And it's super annoying when that happens. It seems we're so spoiled with content these days. It seems like everything could be at our beck and call yeah. and to actually have to work a little bit for this album. I, maybe that's part of it too, is that this is very much a fervent fan base, right? There's very much people that are deeply in love with this album. And what you just described, that's the shit I love in this podcast is, it's not just that you love the album, it's that it changed your life literally. That's yeah. amazing to have that kind of influence on you, especially that specific song. It's yeah, great. absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, and I mean, the rest of the album is awesome. Like this is an album that when I do revisit it, like I can go through the whole thing and, and I don't think that there's any like skip tracks on this. Like everything works really well. And, you know, as a runner up, I mean, Modern Angel is just like, I remember when I was like, you know, when I found this album, I was 14 or 15 probably at the time, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, it was like, it was right after like, the downward spiral came out you know yeah. and this felt like even more like raw and forbidden and evil mm -hmm. than anything on a nine inch nails album to me i was like oh wow i'm even cooler than everybody else but of course i was just sitting there in my room listening to this by myself <laughs> with no friends but you know that was yeah. the age is like how obscure of music can i get into that's yeah. just for me and uh, <laughs> maybe someday in my 30s i'll meet someone that likes it too and make a friend <laughs> yeah exactly exactly <laughs> but yeah modern angels are a freaking killer song and uh it's so 90s you know like i don't think anybody really makes music like that anymore it's like it's too uncool kind of but like it's so <laughs> awesome for its time you know it definitely makes me think of there are so many soundtracks in the latter half of the 90s that mm -hmm. were heavily, you know, the Dust Brothers and the Chemical Brothers and sure. all the other brothers, all these people, um, you know, it's very like this kind of 
driving track all the time. But you're right. This is not even that. This is what those people that made that stuff were listening to. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So you don't feel like there's a weakest track on the album? I don't think so. Like, honestly, like, I guess maybe I would go like with Genocide, which is kind of like just weird and almost a little bit hip hop. And mm-hmm. uh, and I mean, I, I like a lot of hip hop, but like, I don't know, maybe it just doesn't fit quite as well as some of the other tracks. But it's still really cool, though, when you're kind of in the mood for it. Right on. I typically will pick what I think are the best tracks and the least good tracks and the most underrated tracks. Since I'm so unfamiliar with this album, I won't make any big proclamations like that. I will say that Genocide made me kind of go, huh, dancing about Genocide. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, the one that stuck out to me the most that I think that grabbed me the most until the outro, because it gets kind of droney, Crushed, the first version of Crushed, I thought was really great. Absolutely. Crushed is a song that like, it, and you know, Front 242 being like this kind of weird fringe group in a way, you know, like, I feel like if that song had somehow hit, their mm-hmm. trajectory would be so different, like going forward from this, because this is kind of the end of their output for a while. Like, oh, you really? know, yeah, like they did end up putting out another album in the 2000s, but otherwise it was just like remix albums, live albums, uh, going in and like doing new versions of old song albums, but they didn't like make new albums after this in 93, they put out two albums. It was uh, this Evil Off and then uh, Fuck Up Evil. And after that, yeah, like they just kind of, I don't know, they just kind of folded in on themselves and just became like a live group. But yeah, I think that if Crushed had hit, because it really could have, like it's a great song and it has, yeah, it's catchy. It has some pop appeal to it. Yeah, I I think that's a great song and definitely could have been something. So fans do call it evil off. You're not like, oh, five, colon, two, two, colon. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Life's too short. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I always ask my guests this question, too. Is there a song on this album that you feel like maybe in revisiting it this time that you'd underrated previously? Well, I think, I mean, honestly, it might be crushed. But, you know, just to kind of throw another one in there, I would say uh, the combo of serial killers don't kill their girlfriend slash serial killers don't kill their boyfriend, which okay. is really weird. And, you know, I kind of wrote down here because I made a few notes on some of the songs. I wrote that it's the most 90s song on the album. Like, it, it's like aggressively uncool, <laughs> like you know, but but it's like really interesting and unique and like very specific to like this very specific moment in music. Listening to it like through, you know, 2023 years, like it just was uh, 
it definitely stood out in a way that I, I was like, these tracks are actually pretty damn cool in their own unique way. Yeah, the first pass through the album, that was the first song that really got my attention. And some of the lyrics are a touch cringy. Yeah, yeah. But you're right, it's very of the era, and it's good. It sticks out as one of the better tracks on the album, I thought, too. For sure. Absolutely. For sure. So uh, did you ever get a chance to see this band live? I didn't. I did get to meet Richard 23 once, oh. though. It was a premiere of a Wax Tracks Records documentary mm -hmm. in L.A., and uh, I got a picture with him and I told him you know, how inspirational he was. He was really cool. But uh, I've never gotten to see them live and they're still touring like constantly. Like, oh, they haven't been to Vegas. Uh, hopefully they come to Vegas. Otherwise, maybe I'll catch them in L.A. one day. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, it's definitely on the bucket list. I mean, I've seen practically all the other, you know, industrial groups. I don't know why it just hasn't lined up yet. You know, in the lead up to this, I had never listened to those live albums and I listened to like pretty much all of them there's a lot of them mm -hmm. but they're like crazy good and i'm not a big live album guy though mm -hmm. so like it's not really something i would listen to regularly but like finally getting a chance to check those out like i bet it's an awesome show and at this point they've been doing it for so long especially if they kind of stop releasing albums they've gone like full billy joel and just kind of rested on their laurels <laughs> yeah yeah so they're going to be really tight with what they're doing i bet it would be a good show yeah they are European, right? They're not from the U.S.? Yeah, I think Belgian, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, I imagine that would put a kink in trying to see them on any sort of regularity, especially as they're, they've got to be up there at this point. I mean, if we're in oh, our yeah. 40s, they've got to be in their 60s or something. I would think so, yeah. But those guys, they just never stop. You know, I'm actually going to see uh, Thrill Kill Cult next month. Nice. Which, in my deep dive of re-listening to these Front 242 albums, I went back to them, too, and they're another favorite from that era. So, you know, uh, that'll be an interesting show. <laughs> this is also music to my ears. When a guest has, like, gotten into other stuff that they hadn't listened to in a while, you know what I mean, like in preparation for the show, and just like, yeah. that's what I'm aiming for, is just to get everyone to jump into that nostalgia. Well, then I've got a story for you because another thing that this led me down, something I've been looking for for years, and I finally found it thanks to a Nine Inch Nails Facebook group. Mm -hmm. I was like going down the rabbit hole and all that, and there was this thing back in like this era. Um, you know, this was, you know, pre internet, and I used to like mail away for CDs of just random software and stuff like that. Okay. And in my head, they were called Euro demos, but I'd always Googled that and could never find anything. Someone in this Nine Inch Nails group was like, oh no, that's called Demo Scene. And he pointed me to a link on YouTube to like some like compilations of Demo Scene videos and I found them and I hadn't seen these things since, I mean, basically since the internet, like since like 96 or seven, you know, something like that. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's all these artists in kind of the same vein as what's on this album, like that kind of like dark industrial electronic mm -hmm. kind of thing set to these videos from like these hacker groups that they would like make these like kind of like pixel art music videos to go with the songs. And back then they were actually like EXE files, like executable uh -huh. files wow. that you would like download and like take off the cd and you would like run them in dos and they were like a program it wasn't you know there was no youtube yeah. so you weren't watching them on youtube and so yeah and I, I used to watch these constantly and, and again they were like a big part of inspiring my own music and yeah i finally saw these things again like in the lead up to this because of asking like what you know what was that music yeah. you know and yeah finally found it and that stuff is still so cool and it's like it's the same exact little side subgenre of industrial that this album is and it's super cool the idea of like planting that on cds and you know not every fan that even had the cd necessarily would be aware that it was on there maybe like yeah like the internet before the internet i guess is what i'm getting yeah, at. <laughs> you know, absolutely. this underground way of putting that stuff out there that's great that you were able to revisit that stuff and get that back in your head Absolutely. And now I have a new goal of trying to like find these people and get them to make a music video for me. So. <laughs> They'd probably be like, oh, thank God, someone remembers us. <laughs> I, mean, this, yeah, I right. mean, again, like, I mean, there's got to be a very small but fervent niche of people that are in love with that stuff. Totally. So this is an album you did put down for a little while, right? Did you ever put down front 242 or 242 or did you just kind of like always stick with them, but not necessarily this album? 
Yeah, no, I, I hadn't listened to them in years. Like I always cited them whenever like, you know, I did some interviews and stuff mm -hmm. about my music and like people would ask, you know, what bands inspired you. And they were always a band I mentioned, but I hadn't listened to them in years because yeah, it's like most of what I love of them is on CD. And like I said, my CD collection is just sitting there gathering dust. So like, yeah. I just uh, hadn't really like come along to them again. Like I think maybe like every five years or so I would maybe look them up on YouTube or something, but yeah, it's not something that I listen to regularly anymore. And nowadays as I've gotten older, I've gotten more uh, into my old man phase of listening to singer songwriters. So, you know, I was sure. definitely not jamming out to this stuff as much anymore. Yeah. Not cracking the old light sticks and, yeah, hanging out in your basement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what track do you think we should use to go out on when we're done with this interview? Oh boy. Uh, I would say animal, animal, animal. I guess go with like the full version, animal zoo track 11, because that song comes up like four or five times and yeah. each time it grows a little bit, it's like more ambient on the first track. And then it's like glitchy, like gated in the second track. And then it's a little more full in the third. And then it comes back later on, like as a full, full song. And uh, yeah, track 11, Animal Zoo, like that's the full one. And yeah, you got to go out with that one because it's just so... It's so upbeat. It, like, I think if you hear that song and you've never heard the album, mm -hmm. like, you'd be like, okay, I got to check this album out. It's the attention grabber. Yeah. Gotcha. Anything else you want to say about this album or this band before we move on to other stuff? Um, I guess the only other thing would be that, like I said, there was like the sister album that came out the same year, uh, Up Evil. Mm -hmm. And that is something that for some reason i always just kind of looked at it as like a remix collection but it really is like its own separate entity and it's pretty damn good i always like this one more though just because it, it had like a i don't know like a darker vibe to it even from the album cover yeah. it felt like it had a darker vibe and so it definitely like just kind of always appealed to me more but it is cool though that they put these two albums out together i love that that they it builds the mythos especially mm. with like the numbering titles and all that stuff like it, it's it's a really weird specific discography to have and i guess that if you had that kind of dark vibe and all this kind of cryptic stuff then people can really apply whatever they're going through or feeling at the time onto the music yeah. especially if they're in a darker place and kind of like a maybe you know like a frustrated teenage angst kind of place sure which i think we all were in 93 to 94 roughly a little bit or at least yeah. those of us born in 1980. <laughs> <laughs> I remember thinking and like convincing myself that the album cover was in 3D. I used to just stare at it with 3D glasses on, and I don't, I don't think it is, but I, I had totally convinced myself it was. <laughs> well, you tried. You certainly yeah. tried for it to be. <laughs> yeah. So you said you listen to singer songwriters these days. What are you uh, listening to of late? Just uh, what's on your radar? Oh man, I, uh, I I'm huge into artists like jason isbell okay ryan adams yeah, uh yeah all, all that kind of stuff um the war on drugs mm -hmm. you know that's kind of more my jam nowadays uh as my wife calls it dad music <laughs> <laughs> you know? and uh trying to split my time up now we have podcasts so trying to split my time up it's definitely a little bit difficult and then of course with my own music because you know when you're making music you gotta listen back to your own stuff like a thousand times over to make sure it's good mm -hmm. so uh yeah it, it kind of reduces my music listening time but those are kind of the three big ones i'm also a really big fan of sam fender i don't know if you know mm -hmm. him let's look into him yeah another, another kind of singer songwriter type and uh yeah i mean that that's kind of the the artist i've been listening to the most the cure is ever present in my life like since i was 13 so that, they'll never go away also speaking of twitter earlier robert smith has got to be my favorite twitter follow oh he's great <laughs> he's fun <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and and look at he was able to make the most successful tour of the summer not counting taylor swift pretty awesome even with giving people their money back on tickets and stuff like i mean and setting like really low prices i mean he's He's a hero. Yeah. You know? That is super, super cool. Very much yeah. so. All right. I have one last question for you. I always ask my guests kind of like a random, not exactly a trivia question, but more like, um, would you rather from the 1990s? I'm going to ask you questions about talk radio 
from the 1990s, mm-hmm. which okay, you know, because this is before podcasts, you know, and we're both sure. podcasters. Being a podcaster, I have another podcast, a movie podcast, and I've been doing that for a few years. And I kind of got to this stage where I was like hardly listening to music at all anymore. And I was like, fuck, what am I doing? Like, I mean, like, it's great to listen to podcasts, but that was half of my motivation and starting the music podcast was kind of like nice create homework for myself and kind of make me listen to stuff and stuff from the era that I hadn't listened to before or as much, which has been nice. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was in the same boat. And yeah, I've been trying to force myself to listen to more music lately. I, I don't know if you know the app Music Board. Mm-mm. It's kind of like Letterbox for movies, oh. but for music, it's like literally a clone of Letterbox. Cool. It's kind of awesome. And yeah, I've been um, reviewing albums on there, like everything I listen to. And yeah, I, I'm just kind of forcing myself outside of my comfort zone just because like, yeah, I, I kind of collapse in my same like four artists over and over again on loop and you know. It's easy to do. Yeah. So I, I've been listening to all kinds of stuff from modern rap, Taylor Swift, just like all, all over the place. And then back to, you know, all the classic industrial stuff, everything that I haven't listened to in forever. So yeah, you, you got to kind of push yourself sometimes when we get older to go back to all kinds of music. Yep. Otherwise, I mean, I found myself just listening to the same two bands bands for like a fucking decade i was like all right yeah there's more out there than warren ziva <laughs> that's right <laughs> the white stripes and ravenettes were me for all of my 20s practically <laughs> yeah it was warren ziva and van morrison for all of my 30s and little else nice. <laughs> yeah nice. so i have a question for you about 90s talk radio because that's like, the closest we had to podcasting at the time some of it was real trash as you know and mm. some of it was pretty good i don't know if you did you listen to much of that kind of stuff back in the day i was more like the late night talk show yeah those things i didn't really listen to much talk radio though well yeah that's what i mean like i'll give you five different talk show whatever like a host slash show names and you tell me which one you think is the best and which one you would kick to the curb and i think i have a feeling which one you would kick to the curb because i know which one i would kick to the curb okay so for instance a prairie home companion started in the 1990s which ira glass very um don't put this on while driving or i'll fall asleep talk radio sure right Mm-hmm. Then you had on the opposite end of that, you had Howard Stern and his whole like crew of people and pornographers often on his show, which that would get your attention, keep you up while you're driving. Sure. And then speaking of driving, do you remember Car Talk? Oh, I, yeah, yeah. Remember those, those two brothers, they, had, they were like Super Boston or whatever accent yeah. they had. They would talk about <laughs> right. car, like Clank and Crunk, whatever the fuck their names were. <laughs> right, right. That's an option for you to choose from. You might recall an individual named Rush Limbaugh got very famous in the 1990s. <laughs> you know, poisoning the minds of our fathers for, uh, mm-hmm. for a good decade or two. And then, of course, there was Love Line with Dr. Drew and Adam Carolla, which, do you remember that one? Yeah, sure. Yeah. That was a big hit because then, like, it was often late at night and it'd be like the only place you'd hear people talking about masturbation and like mm-hmm. all this kind of stuff in a very frank and open forum. So, which one of these would you listen to today if you had to? Which one of these would you shoot to the moon in a rocket to blow up and disappear forever? Yeah, obviously Rush Limbaugh Woo! is uh, going bye bye. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, but aside from that, I mean, I remember Love Line being a lot of fun. I wonder, it's probably pretty cringy nowadays looking back at some of it, but uh, still, it, it was it was fun at the time, and I bet that that would be like the fun pick to go back to. Uh, I was never really a big Stern guy. Like he's all right, but yeah, I, I'll go with Love Line. I think I would go with Love Line too. I, I was never a car guy, but the car talk show was kind of fun just because they had fun personalities. But Love Line yeah. was like a, it was like a guilty pleasure kind of thing. Yeah. And yeah, I bet you're right. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on to the show and making time to do it. I really, really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. And it was great revisiting all this music because, I mean, like I said, it's awesome. And uh, it was great to talk about it. I feel like I got an education. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Big thank you to Dave Rosen for coming on the show. I knew nothing about Front 242 before meeting him. 
And uh, now I do. He has helped expand my knowledge of 9394, which I'm trying to do that for you as a listener and trying to do that for myself as a podcaster. I enjoy it. If you want to check out Dave's podcast where he talks about movies with all kinds of people, it's called Piecing It Together. You can find it anywhere you listen to podcasts. I definitely recommend checking it out. If you want to check out his music, you are currently listening to the song Secret Places from his 2022 album More Content. that on spotify or wherever you could google david rosen or david rosen music you'll find it he's got it posted in a lot of places and where i'd ordinarily at this point kind of do a call out trying to get someone to come on the show and like play a band well you know i'm, I'm playing dave so listen to dave but if you two want to come on the show i would love it if you did so please reach out to me why not what's stopping you nothing nothing's stopping you you could email me at 9394podcast at gmail.com. That's the numerical 9394 and then podcast, all one word, at gmail.com. You can find me on, well, me and Dave talked about Twitter. Twitter doesn't exist anymore. It's some fucking stupid site called X. I've deleted my Twitter account. You can't find me there anymore. Uh, you can find me on threads and you can find me on Facebook. I'm pretty active on those if you want to follow me on social media those those are the places i'm actually at i'm not really anywhere else and i suppose that'll do it yeah okay thank you so much for coming on this journey with me do please rate and review the show it it helps it helps me a lot so i'd appreciate it and um okay yeah take care Ninety-three, ninety-four. a music podcast with Travis Roy, is a labor of love. It is not and never will be monetized. Please don't sue.